Okay, I think we're live on YouTube now, so we can start the meeting. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our special planning committee and official plan review working committee meeting on October 28th. Um, I welcome and I'm going to call this to order at 1.07 in the afternoon. Uh, this is being held in accordance with uh, Section 238 of the Municipal Act 2001 due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I am now going to verify uh, that all our members are present. I think we are now missing Councillor Hayes. She was here, so it may be that she's just been kicked out of the internet and come back on again. And we have um, all of our um, official plan review working committee members with us. Oh, here she is, break back in. Uh, so, uh, Public input has been, uh, I apologize. I also want to acknowledge um, Summer Valentine. Welcome, she's the Director of Planning from District. So she's joining us today. And of course, Mr. McDonald and Summer and uh, Mr. Diamond and our CAO and Mr. Pink and other um, staff members are present. So we have advised, uh, we have asked for input from planning at muskokalakes.ca for this meeting. I don't believe we had any emails come in from that. I think it probably was taken care of in our public um, meeting. And also the motions are pre-populated randomly to move things along and voting will be done by the raise of our hands if that isn't possible. We will vote uh, electronically or, or verbally, but it won't be counted as a um, recorded vote. So I think that that's it. Uh, there is no supplementary agenda today. And I guess I will first ask if anybody has any conflicts that they would like to acknowledge. No? Okay. So I'm going to read this motion then by Councillor Edwards and Councillor Mazan. Uh, to, re to um, be it resolved that pursuant to section 2.3.2 of the Township's Procedural Bylaw 2019-79, the rules of procedure are hereby suspended for the duration of the official plan review policy directions discussion and that they be reinstated at the conclusion of the discussion. Any comments? All in favor? Madam Clerk? Oh, thank you, that carries. Okay, that's great. So uh, we're all back here to review the official plan. We've had the public input for it. And um, so I think you, you have the discussion outline, which was given to us in our, um, in our package and the summary and the, and the policy directions. So I'm going to either ask Mr. Pink or Mr. McDonald to sort of review everything and bring us up to date. And I wonder, Mr. McDonald, we've had a few comments come in from, uh, from our committee yesterday. And I, I just wondering after you've sort of done the initial before we open the floor, if I might just comment on a couple of things that don't fit into where we're going to be discussing things anyway, if that makes sense to you. It does, please proceed. Uh, would you like me to do that now? Um, I can, and then you can just take it over if you like. Oh, what, what I could possibly do maybe is start and then we'll see where we go from there um, in terms of how the meeting uh, is supposed to be structured today. We also have another three hours set up uh, for Friday as well. And I'm hoping we don't need it, but we're available to you to certainly assist in any of the uh, discussions that need to be held. Um, there was an agenda provided uh, to you uh, that set out uh, a couple of things about today that I just wanted to run through uh, with Planning Advisory Committee and uh, the working group. And firstly, I wanted to remind uh, all, the, all on the call uh, exactly what policy directions are. And they're not policies. I know I've said that many times, but I like repeating myself sometimes. Uh, they're instead really guiding principles that are intended to set the direction for how the actual policies are going to be written later. There will be lots of time and many opportunities uh, for this group to actually review the policies we come up with uh, as a consequence of this process. So in discussing anything today, there will always be an opportunity to rediscuss something later when you actually see what it looks like on paper in language uh, written in the form of a policy. 
You'll also note that some of the policy directions have specific uh, uh, impacts on the zoning bylaw. Well, we're not writing a zoning bylaw right now, and we're not planning on writing a zoning bylaw right now, uh, but at some point the township will need to do that. So there are a few policy direction, directions that get at, well, the zoning bylaw should do this and should do that and should do this. And we're certainly happy to discuss them and perhaps discuss what the zoning may actually look like when we get to that point or when the township gets to that point. Uh, but that is pretty far down the road uh, in terms of actually making decisions on exactly what kinds of numbers, for example, uh, will be going into a zoning bylaw. So I just wanted to leave that with you as well. From my perspective, uh, at least, uh, the purpose of the meeting today uh, is to determine whether any of the policy directions that you've all worked so hard on uh, up until this point need to be changed as a consequence of the input that was received uh, through the public process uh, and, and afterwards uh, as a consequence of, of the survey. And you've got a very well-written summary of the consultation that has occurred uh, with some extensive commentary on many of the policy directions and uh, prepared by Laura Consulting. I have to say they did a very good job uh, at the session, uh, very pleased uh, with how it was run uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the outcome of it. And I believe uh, many others feel the same way. So we're really happy about that. In terms of what happens after these meetings are held, uh, Planning Advisory Committee will be asked to endorse uh, the policy directions in principle, and I included the word in principle because we always need some wiggle room uh, when we write policy um, and in order to allow for further discussion to occur later on when the policies are actually in front of you. And essentially, uh, once they're endorsed in principle, uh, our team will then begin the job of writing the first draft of the official plan that is in accordance with the policy directions. And along the way, of course, we'll think very carefully about what the directions say and come up with what, with what we think uh, is the appropriate wording to implement it. However, that will be up to you when you see that later on in terms of whether we got it right or not. And again, further discussion will obviously be uh, possible. So in terms of the overall agenda, um, I think I've just gone through the agenda. Uh, sorry, the introduction of the meeting today. Um, I'm happy to review the uh, results of the consultation process. However, uh, the uh, document is very well written and we're certainly happy to take any questions that folks may have uh, on what is in the, uh, uh, the summary document prepared by Laura Consulting. And then what I'd like to do is make a determination at that point on which policy directions need further discussion. And I'd like to take a poll at that point and identify which ones we're gonna attack and which one we're gonna discuss. And that'll all be written down. And then we'll go through them one by one. And anybody who wants to uh, say anything about uh, the ones we're talking about, obviously, uh, this is the time uh, to figure uh, out what uh, folks are thinking uh, and whether in the end, any of them require any changes uh, or wordsmithing to more accurately reflect uh, what Planning Advisory Committee uh, and the working group would like to see. Um, then we'll obviously go through those relevant policy directions. And of course, I'd like to always uh, leave some time at the end of these meetings for any other business. You've got the consulting team here. Uh, David and his team are here as well. And we're happy to certainly talk about anything related to the official plan um, so that uh, no stone is left unturned, so to speak, in terms of how uh, we're proceeding. And then of course, we'll talk about next steps. Um, so we do have three hours today. Um, I'm thinking that somewhere in the middle, uh, um, uh, Madam Bridgman, you could uh, uh, suggest that a break be held so that everyone could take one. And then we'll make sure we end at 4 p.m. so everyone can get on their way and move on to whatever else they're going to move on to. So with that being said, um, I'll turn it back to you uh, for any comments you wish to make and, and, and add to that before we get going. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mc thank you, Mr. McDonald. I just have a couple of comments uh, from the emails that came in because I want to acknowledge them. Uh, in, in terms of they actually, some of the questions I don't believe apply to the, to the discussions today. One of them was downsizing of commercial resorts. We are going to do a, a, an OPA 
in detail on those. So that will certainly be looked at at another time under the OPA. Um, and then uh, I think that's pretty well it. The only other thing, the only thing that came up under number 29, Mr. McDonald, was, and that is the um, rental program for the commercial resorts, concern that if a resort did not run for a full year, that we ensure in the wording, and I'll leave that to you, that even seasonally open resorts, they have to be rented out during those summer months. And besides that, everything else we've received, I believe is going to be part of your discussion. So thank you. Okay, that's, uh, that's great. Um, I did make a bit of a list of uh, the policy directions that I think uh, there is uh, a desire to discuss. Uh, David uh, uh, Pink and his email to the group identified four right off the top uh, that seemed to uh, be just seemed to want to be discussed by by a few folks around the table. Uh, I'll go through those quickly in terms of what they are and then we'll get into them. The first obviously is recreational carrying capacity. That was policy direction number two. Uh, grandfathering of existing development that was policy direction number 19. Uh, setbacks from uh, the water uh, and in particular the increase uh, from 20 to 30. That was in policy direction one and 17. It was dealt with in both. Um, fourthly, short-term rentals, and that's policy direction uh, 15. Um, Patricia Arney uh, raised a few as well in a subsequent email. And I'm just gonna list those for, for, uh, for now. Uh, first was uh, policy direction number eight, 10 and 11, intensification, rural law creation and attainable housing. And I think they were all under the theme of, well, COVID is here, uh, what does that mean for growth in the township? Should we talk about these policy directions any, any further? And I think that was where she was coming from and obviously she could uh, ex explain that a little further. Uh, policy direction three was also raised, uh, that deals with flooding. Uh, policy direction five, cumulative impacts. Policy direction six, watershed planning. Policy direction 21, employee accommodation on resort properties. Um, the other two that I have on my list, uh, these came from Laurie Thompson, two were already covered off, but one was policy direction 12, contractors yards, and policy direction 27, waterfront character. Um, so those are the ones that I have on my list uh, that folks have uh, identified in advance. Um, and I've got them all written out here in scribbles, uh, but perhaps now is the time to ask if there are any others that folks want to speak to, I'll get it on the list here and we'll make sure we come to that uh, when we do, uh, whenever we do. Thank you. Um, Member Lundell, I see that you'd like to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this isn't a, about the policy directions per se, but more in terms of the process and a sort of general question. Um, as we're considering what we've got in terms of public input this time, how does that fit with the public input that we got during the visioning session last summer? Um, I see that we had 853 participants in our initial visioning and their messages were quite clear. And then we had about 500 participants this time. So the participation has gone down 40%. Um, is this something that we should be reading anything into? Um, or, or how does our consulting team feel? Do they feel that the people who took part in the visioning session uh, possibly assume that we're just pursuing the directions that were raised at that time? Mr. McDonald? Yeah, so I can speak on behalf of the consulting team and others may have uh, different views. Ultimately, it's up to planning advisory committee to be satisfied uh, with respect to the consultation program the results of the, of the consultation and whether it's a success or not. Uh, but I can tell you from my perspective that we're very pleased uh, with the, the consultation that's occurred uh, to date. Uh, yes, the numbers are less uh, the second time around, uh, but that doesn't mean that the value of the consultation is any less uh, in any way. Uh, in fact, uh, many people spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time uh, with us that day and, and after that day, thinking very carefully about some very detailed uh, policy directions and the technicalities of each. Um, and in the end, uh, we got some very thoughtful comments and I think people really appreciated being part of the process. 
Um, I am anticipating that similar sessions like these will be held as we go forward. And of course, we'll be talking about those uh, with uh, Planning Advisory Committee before they're organized uh, to get your support and input before they're organized. But we're very happy uh, with the, uh, the, the consultation process today. I apologize, just uh, hearing hearing from Mr. Pink, um, just if I can interject this at this point, um, Ms. Valentine is only with us for about an hour and a half. So as we get into these discussions, if there's anything that would involve the district, perhaps we could just ensure that we talk about them before she has to leave. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, um, I had um, a couple I wanted to, a few that, well, I have some that I want to add for discussion, further discussion. Um, I un understand, Mr. McDonald, you talked about um, discussing what come out of the, the, the public workshop, but also it's a, um, we're moving forward for council approval on the proposed policy direction. So I think we have, we need to revisit minorly some of the other topics such as um, um, Lake Health System number one, um, flooding hazards number three. Uh, and uh, number 22, mineral resources. Now there's, I don't think there's a lot of discussion in those, just that I want, um, and I'm afraid to, I'm gonna use the term a little bit of wordsmithing or additional points in, in those things to make it um, clear exactly what the, the direction uh, should be. Thank you, appreciate that. So I've got those written down as well. Okay, great. Uh, Mayor Harding? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess through you a question, I'm not sure whether Mr. McDonald wants to answer it or not, but you brought up at the beginning that there was some questions about down zoning resorts and you suggested we're gonna deal with that in an OPA at a later date. I, I guess my question is, <clears throat> the OP is theoretically open. Why wouldn't we deal with it at this particular point? Why would we go through a separate OPA just to deal with down zoning? Can't we put that on the table at this particular point? Uh, through you uh, to Mayor Harding, I believe it was Councillor Bridgman that said that. Um, David and I have had a few conversations about the resort policy framework. Uh, and while those conversations haven't been concluded, uh, there is a sense that yes, uh, we can uh, look at the resort policies as part of the overall official plan review process. The challenge, and I'm sure David would like to add to this, is that the district will also be doing the same thing. Um, so there's a, there's a question about what happens there, what impact it has on uh, Muskoka Lakes and vice versa. So that's the only thing that's sort of still out there. Uh, I'm certainly prepared and willing and happy to uh, address those issues through the official plan review without going through an official plan amendment process that's separate. However, uh, I think we should keep that open um, because the district is also doing the same thing uh, with my assistance, I should note. Um, so there is a need to coordinate how these things come together. And, and in the end, we don't have an answer on exactly how that's going to occur. Thank you. Supplemental, if I may well, then, uh, yeah. Chair Bridgman. I, I guess my point being, as we are going through this process right now, we could always potentially take it out. Um, and I agree that we need to do a full resort policy update, which we are working on in tandem with the district. But I don't think it would harm under Section 29 commercial resorts to float a question or policy that the possibility of down zoning and get some initial public feedback that may fill into a later actual resort policy update. So um, I guess I'd like to just reserve that at this particular point. And maybe the world says, no, we shouldn't be doing it. But I think we can always take it out. But if we don't put it in at this point while it's open, um, I think it's just a smart thing to do. If I could respond to that, uh, because uh, I anticipate there may be a desire to consider adding policy directions. If you were asking for my recommendation, I wouldn't add any at this point. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about whatever you want to talk about uh, in a policy discussion later on when we're writing the official plan. And the reason I say that is because we spent a lot of time writing these and coming up with these. And then we specifically went out to the public with 29 policy directions. 
And in the end, um, while some may come off the table, I don't anticipate that. In the end, there might be some changes and wordsmithing to them, but I'm not thinking that it would do the consultation process a service if we started adding policy directions after we went to the public to talk about the 29 we talked about. Um, having said that, um, certainly if that's the will of the Planning Advisory Committee, certainly we'll, we'll, we'll obviously do that, um, but I'm not recommending it. Um, and again, uh, that doesn't mean they can't be uh, discussed later. Uh, and we do have a series of meetings set up to talk about the first draft of the official plan when it's prepared, and there will be ample opportunity to, to review, those, um, uh, review those ideas, particularly related to, to downzoning and anything else at that time. And then we'll be going back out to the public and get, getting their comments. Those are my thoughts uh, as, as the consultant. Others may have different views, um, and I'm certainly open to any views out there. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Just for clarification, what you're really saying is anything that we think we might want to introduce, we'll wait until we're ready to go out to the public again so we can have their input. I just want to make sure we're all clear on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes? Thank you, and through you. Um, I'm going to recommend we take something off of the table. Uh, you had said earlier that short-term rentals would be something that would be addressed through um, a leasing policy or bylaws, and it didn't necessarily have to be in the OP. We have so many issues that are really priority issues. I would recommend that we just drop this one completely or put it at the very lowest priority and carry on with the more important things like our waterfront development and our uh, lakefront and our site inspections. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want to respond to that, Mr. McDonald, or not? Um, I, I think we can discuss it uh, when we get the full list together, um, and let's leave it uh, there for now. Sure. Uh, Member Arney? Uh, you're still muted, uh, Patricia. Thank you, Chair Birchman, and through you to Nick. Um, we had the numbers, 75% of the public consultation were seasonal members. Do you have similar numbers for the written in responses, percentages wise in terms of people who live here or people who are seasonal? I do not, yes, thank you. I do not have uh, that information at this time, uh, but I will endeavor to get it uh, for our next meeting. Thank you. Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I would just like to follow on a comment uh, made uh, by Mayor Hardy in, uh, in regard to um, under the commercial resort area, discussing the down zoning of resorts. I think we should also expand that. Uh, you'll notice that that subject did go out to the public. There are public comments on it. And, and we're all aware over the last several months that we have, uh, LPAT has, has um, recognized deficiencies in our official plan in this area. And I would think it would be helpful if we identified those deficiencies and, and, and looked at them uh, as, as part of trying to um, uh, patch those problem areas. I'm not talking about a complete review of resorts, but things uh, uh, things like a number of week, weeks in a rental pool definitions. Um, and then of course the public raised the issue of what about all the uh, uh, the uh, good work that's been done by the, by the steering committee. So, so I just think that shouldn't just be left hanging. I think, uh, and I think it, it was out to the public. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Ishikawa. Thank you, and I'm sorry if I'm not in the right order or saying something. I did did want to eventually have a discussion about um, accessibility and my concerns about um, that we are we are going to just go with what the poli the the provincial policy statement would say, but I think we have to discuss more on that topic and um, just don't know when, where, when and where that will happen, so. 
Okay, I'm going to suggest that perhaps that falls into the category of the downsizing for resorts where we discuss that once our once this is back to us and then it could go out to the public council. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know that I would agree with that. Um, I, I think that it's, I, I don't want to lump it into a different category that um, I think there has to be a bigger discussion and we don't discuss this. And, and in fact, we certainly discuss it at district, but we don't discuss it at the township Muskoka Lakes. So I don't want to lump it into something that is really doesn't have anything to do with resorts in particular. Uh, so that, that's my concern because um, we're not in a good place right now is, is what I'm saying. And I don't know how to get this addressed. So Mr. Pink, can you help me? Is this a land use issue? Thank you, Chair. Um, um, hello, uh, committees. Uh, in response to uh, Councillor Nishikawa's question, um, the you know accessibility certainly can come up during the review of uh, typically site plan uh, approvals and the review of that development. Um, I know uh, I've spoken to Councillor Nishikawa in the past, and uh, we do not have an accessibility committee uh, due to our population. We're not required to, uh, but there I believe uh, the clerk uh, may be discussing putting that discussion item on a future agenda for council to discuss whether we wish to establish uh, an accessibility advisory committee. Um, certainly can become a component of, of policies. Uh, I'm not sure if we need a policy direction uh, per se uh, at this stage, but I'd look to uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, hopefully that helps clarify a little bit in that regard. Uh, perhaps uh, if I could just quickly respond to, um, I think it was member uh, Arnie or Lundell, I believe asked about um, the results, of the demographic breakdown. I do have the raw data of um, uh, from the survey results. And I think the question was a breakdown of seasonal versus permanent residents. Uh, so uh, of the, it was approximately uh, 400 odd responses, 223 identified as a part-time residence, 110 um, identified as a full-time uh, resident. There was 41 who work in Muskoka Lakes, 50 who volunteer, 34 who run a business and 28 others. So hopefully that answered the uh, question. Mr. McDonald doesn't have to uh, report back. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Um, Mr. McDonald, do you want to comment on the accessibility topic? Yes, I, I can. And I do note that we actually do have a policy direction that deals with accessibility. I believe it is policy direction 25. It's pretty basic. Uh, but let's put that on the list and uh, we'll, we'll certainly get to it when we get to it um, as part of our overall discussion. So there is something there on accessibility. I would agree with uh, uh, Mr. Pink, though, that generally speaking, it's, a, it's an issue that's dealt with uh, closer to the building stage than at the policy stage. However, uh, some municipalities do include policies that make it very clear that accessibility is a, is a consideration uh, in, in, in everything the municipality does, uh, making decisions about its own facilities, for example, uh, to requiring uh, that uh, efforts be made uh, in any construction, uh, particularly where the public will access uh, to ensure that it's accessible. I, I think that would happen in any event in the official plan, uh, but we're certainly happy to discuss it further. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Nishikawa? Your your hand is still up. Do you have a follow-up? Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, so my concern again is is really um, our policy is based on five thousand people or six thousand people. We don't have a policy that actually addresses the the true number of um, of people that are residing here for six months of the year. Uh, and, and that's what I want to have further discussion on. So I'm glad to hear that we will have communication because it, it isn't just about, it, it's, it's all, it's all, it covers so many areas. And, and that's why I don't, don't want to see this uh, discussion go away. Okay, thank you. I believe that's all the questions at this stage, Mr. McDonald. 
Well, that's great. So we've got uh, quite a bit, quite a list, a little bit more than the four that David thought we would be talking about, uh, but that's fine. Uh, we've got the time and certainly want, we want to make sure in the end uh, that we've got it right in terms of uh, what the policy directions say and, uh, and, and to ensure that they're going in the direction that uh, this group wants to go in. So um, I, I think we'll start off with the four that were initially identified uh, in Mr. Pink's email, uh, because those are the four where there were the most comments received, and we're st we'll start off with recreational carrying capacity. Um, I do note uh, that there was, there was some commentary uh, within the uh, uh, consultation summary uh, prepared by Lura Consulting that perhaps can assist in the discussion. Um, and um, and I, I'm going to turn to page five of that summary, and you'll note right at the bottom of that page uh, that there was an acknowledgement uh, that the OP needs to include something on recreational carrying capacity, perhaps a definition. The rationale for determining which small lakes are included in the hard cap and development was requested, so we're happy to talk about that. Uh, some participants expressed uh, should, uh, that the RCC model should only apply to small lakes, while others were, apply were supportive of applying it to larger lakes as well. Uh, we're happy to talk about that. Uh, consideration be given to the lake's volume of water. Um, some have different capacities and perhaps we need a different approach in that regard. Uh, there were mixed views on whether the number of dock spaces uh, in a confined area should be restricted and a concern about the inconsistent application of severance rules, which is something we want to fix as part of the current OP process itself. Now, those were the comments made by Lura. Uh, obviously, uh, that doesn't restrict anyone for bringing anything else up, uh, but I would suggest uh, Chair Bridgman that anyone who wishes to speak on this topic, please do, and we'll see where the conversation goes as a, con as a consequence. Thank you. Could I just ask for one little bit of clarification? I didn't think that as a group we had said there was going to be a hard, uh, like a hard cap with the, I thought that was still under discussion, be it large lakes or small lakes. Am I incorrect on that? Uh, Councillor uh, uh, Chairman Bridgman, uh, the uh, policy direction as written suggests a hard cap for small and medium sized lakes and the, it being used as a guideline on portions of large lakes that function as independent water bodies. And there was quite a bit of discussion about that point and uh, Mr. Diamond can certainly expand upon this, but if there is a, a bay uh, that has a fairly narrow opening and functions somewhat like an independent water body, then perhaps the RCC model can be applied in those circumstances, but as a guideline because it's not a closed system like a small or medium lake is. But we're certainly happy uh, to, uh, to go through that and uh, respond to any questions folks may have on the rationale for that. Okay, thank you. Um, why don't we start with questions and then Mr. Diamond, we may have somebody ask you to go through that rationale. Um, Member Scalati. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, am I unmuted? I guess I must be. Um, my concern, I guess, is maybe I just don't understand the reason why we're including recreational carrying capacity at all, the objective we have. If it's to really reduce traffic and congestion on the waterways, <clears throat> it doesn't seem to me that it's going to be very effective. In my mind, the bigger problem is the number of boats that each of the locations that are already there have. People aren't content anymore with one boat or possibly two. Now we have to have... Uh, uh, personal watercraft as well. So for me, that's the real reason for the problems, not the number of lots. Uh, it's the number of boats. Thank you. I would ask uh, Mr. Diamond to uh, respond uh, to that. If I can, um, under the legislation that enables municipality to regulate things, uh, vessels in the water are beyond the scope of your ability to control what happens in the waterway. So the only way you can really control it is to control how convenient it is um, to actually uh, park boats at a property and uh, get them in and out of the water and the size of boathouses and physical things that are related to the ability to have a number of boats. I remember a survey in Muskoka about 15 years ago that said the average cottage has six boats. Um, so that gives you an example of, of what we're dealing with. Um, so yes, 
the, um, the proposed recreational carrying capacity could limit the number of lots and hence the number of cottages. The recommendation also includes that where lakes are at or near or over capacity, zoning regulations may restrict the size of the docks and waterfront amenity areas to reduce the ability to put more boats in the water and use them at the same time. Okay, thank you. Member Arnie. Thank you, Chair Bertrand, and through you to Jim. Uh, Jim, you've been very good on trying to educate me on RCC. You have not convinced me that it is um, the silver bullet that I believe David uh, referenced. People think it is. They think it's going to control the number of boats. I recognize that it is a tool. And to me, that would be the direction that I think I would prefer that it be referenced as a tool in controlling uh, lake population because um, there was a reference earlier to the volume of the lake, the depth of the lake, the character of the lake is so much more important really. Um, the full occupancy, the number of those lots that are already um, developed uh, as you pointed out, or as when I was going through it, Cassidy Lake um, has the potential to develop 20 more lots. It's a big wetland. And, you know, we can't control that through recreational carrying capacity. But I think we should be looking at it as one of the tools. And hopefully there are some others out there that might be more helpful. So uh, to be clear, first of all, yes. We need a clear definition of what recreational carrying capacity really is and really does. And I think we owe that to everyone on the committee and in the public. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I can just speak briefly to that, Madam of Chair. Course, of course. I think one of the critical things for everyone to understand is that recreational carrying capacity is not an environmental carrying capacity. It is a social carrying capacity. And um, as such, I appreciate what people are saying about the volume of the lake versus the, the, the depth versus the surface area, but it's the surface area that's used by people for their recreational purposes. And so um, there are ties clearly to boats and wakes and erosion and, and eutrophication and all of those things, but the the RCC is just a social carrying capacity, and as such, it is one of the tools in the toolbox to deal with lake capacity. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Thompson. Yes, hi. Um, I was going to say that, yes, it is one of the tools that we have in our toolbox. We've also got the 200 feet water frontage per lot or 300 feet or, what, or whatever we decide to put it at. And we have um, the, the uh, water quality uh, program that we have that can also um, restrict in certain instances what happens on the lake. But um, for some of these small and medium sized lakes, especially ones that are long and narrow, there's really not a lot of room for um, a lot every 200 feet. And some of these you know, small lakes historically have lots every 100 feet. And so, the idea behind the RCC is to say, okay, how many people can um, realistically enjoy themselves out on the lakes at any given time? And um, if you've got a, a limited amount of lake water on some of these small lakes, then you know, putting too many boats, too, too many cottages around the lake means that you're gonna have a lot of boats around the lake. And that's why RCC came into, into being. Um, so I think, and I think that if we don't have it as a hard cap on some of these smaller lakes, then it's going to be very difficult to defend if someone wants to sever a lot. It's going to be hard to say you can't do it because it's not a hard cap. So I'm very much in favor of it as being, you know, it is a tool to limit development on the lakes and for it to be a hard cap on the smaller and medium sized lakes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I like what uh, Pat Ernie had to say and stuff again as it being a tool. Um, 
as we move forward. Um, and I'm, I am concerned about a specific hard cap and sorry, no develop, no anything. Um, it's one of the considerations I think that we need to evaluate and utilize that as a tool. Sometimes we look at things, we do it in our own regular zoning bylaws. I find we are very black and white and not every lot and not every lake is created equally. So um, we don't have it as a tool today. I think, yes, we need to implement it as a tool. And I guess more from a directional perspective consideration where in our official plan or local zoning bylaw, we allow 10% lot coverage, but in our official plan, we allow potentially up to 11%. So that's, I think, from a direction perspective that might get us to the same finish line um, versus the yes, no, um, you know, someone's got a significant piece of property for them to sever off one lot. And, and not everybody uses their property the same. Um, many people have multiple boats. Many people just have a canoe on the lake. So I, I'm just, I'm concerned about that, but I'm happy to let direction and get more public input as we move forward. If I can uh, respond to that uh, quickly, um, you're, you're making a good point about how we actually implement the policy direction. And that's, that's why there will be much opportunity to do that later. Because one thing we haven't thought about is how we actually include a hard cap in the official plan. Uh, does that mean, for example, that in a circumstance like you've just suggested where it, it makes eminent sense on a large property to create one lot, you can't do it because of the hard cap that somebody requires an official plan amendment? Um, yes or no. So we haven't thought about that. That's something we can certainly talk uh, with the group later on. And that's an example of how we will implement these things going forward. Because if there is a concern about the arbitrary nature of the policy direction, then we can write the policy in a way that still uh, uh, still carries forward the principle of what we're trying to achieve, but it comes up with ways of allowing for modifications based on context. So that's, that's an example. Um, so we can certainly keep that and I look forward to having that discussion uh, later on in the process. Good, thank you. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I have a little bit of a concern here. I don't know how it fits, but certainly when um, our council agreed to put in a new boat launch on Clear Lake, it changed the use of that lake because now the public and a lot of public are accessing that lake. So I, I'm not quite sure about the recreation, how that deals with all of the other users that are the day users, if we call them that, um, of how recreation capacity, if, if we implement this, how do we deal with all of the day users? that um, come on to our small lakes. Mr. Diamond, Mr. McDonald, yeah, sure. Mr. Diamond. Um, we will need to, as we define recreational carrying capacity, include factors such as public access as a factor in, in calculating um, uh, recreational carrying capacity. We will need to include factors related to resorts that may exist on the water body and assign some kind of a capacity um, figure to those, those uses as well. Another one is provincial parks. You know, the famous Osler Lake hearing in Seguin Township, there's a provincial park on the lake, um, yet the board still supported the recreational carrying capacity. So all of those factors need to be sorted out as we move through this. And uh, if you're really gonna create a model for uh, Muskoka Lakes, we need to include those factors. Could mean if you open up public access, you reduce the number of lots that can be created in the long term. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Lundell. Um, thank you. And I suppose conversely, uh, it could mean that you decide not to have the public access on that particular lake. Um, so there would be a balance. Um, but I'm just, again, responding to the idea of we went to the public, we asked them for their input on this recreational caring capacity issue. And I didn't really hear any great negative um, opinion on it. Uh, there is a question about the deeper water, which we've dealt with, that's a non-starter. And other than that, it sounded to me from all of this feedback that the public is in support of devising a 
recreational care and capacity policy. And then I would say that it would be up to our consulting team to, to work on what the policy wording should be. Hey, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, just a, a, a question more than anything. Um, in response to uh, Mayor Harding's comments about being too black and white uh, with recreational carrying capacity, isn't that what we're hearing in all of these LPAT setbacks that we are not black and white enough, that we're, we're leaving too much wiggle room or too much sort of arbitrary room in, in, in the way we put our uh, official plan together that <clears throat> makes it unenforceable? Uh, do, Mr. McDonald? Yeah, well, you raise a very good point, and I think that's a, a very useful discussion to have uh, when we actually start writing the policy and you see our first draft, because that will that will be the issue with a lot of these in terms of how we deal with this going forward uh, and thinking about setbacks. Is it, a, is it a hard and fast 30 meter setback or is there a wiggle room? And you'll note in a few places in the policy directions that I indicated that the direction would lead to there being many more minor variances, um, which tells me and tells us that we'll need to really think about the conditions under which a, a, a policy can be modified based on context. And I think that'll be a pretty common theme in our conversations coming up because we are taking a fairly aggressive stance in a couple of these areas, uh, particularly as it relates to setbacks. I'm also thinking that 50 of the lakes in this township are now gonna be prevented from operation. That's a pretty significant step um, as well that I think we'll all have to carefully think through as we develop the policy later on. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Just a few things related to this. I think we all did sort of talk about um, uh, this potentially being a good idea and a good uh, tool in the toolkit for small to medium sized lakes. Um, just a little input from at least the, the group of people that I associate with. Uh, most of the people that were asked this question have no idea what recreational carrying capacity is. So when we go out with a survey and start talking about terminology that we're familiar with, I think we should understand that the majority of people that we're looking for public input from have no idea what we're talking about. Um, and, and, you know, the questions that quite frankly aren't very clear, you know, a, a, a clear question may be, we're looking at implementing recreational carrying capacity on a small to medium sized lake, um, that means you will not be able to create more lots on this lake. Are you for this or against it? Um, versus we seem to ask open-ended questions versus definitive questions that tell people how this is gonna impact them. Um, the next thing I'd just like to ask is, and I mean, this may be Jim or uh, Nick with some follow-up questions. How many lakes have we done recreational carrying capacity studies on? All of them. Okay, so they all have a, a study done and they all have a number associated with them. So if we decide to move ahead with this tool, then we could literally come out as Nick says and say, okay, well, here's 50 lakes that are frozen in two years. And I'm just gonna tell you if we come out with that statement, what we've done historically by doing that is uh, the building department will be busier than they've ever been because lots will be severed before this gets put in place. Uh, cottages will be built and those hard caps will be met. Um, if they haven't already been, uh, we'll start creating a pile of lots and a lot of things where people wouldn't have looked at severing. And this again, you know, History tells us this is exactly what happened in 2007 with the boathouse, the 200 foot and 300 foot boathouse uh, regulation. I mean, we've got more 200 foot boathouses than we ever would have had um, because people thought they would lose them. Anyway, that's that's my only input. I I, I think it's a good tool. I think uh, I think it's one of the tools that should be considered when severing a lot. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hayes. Yes, I think I have to agree with um, Member Clark. I would like to have a clearer idea of how exactly it affects those 50 lakes, if there's any development left on them, because if there's 40 lakes with no development, 
or severances that could happen, then we're only dealing with 10 lakes. But you're dealing with the current rights of owners right now. And when you take away or you lessen those rights, you have to give them a good reason that you're doing that. And I know that it takes time to do it. And I think um, Member Clark is correct. We're going to see a flurry of activity where we would not have seen development if that happened. I'd like to uh, just respond uh, quickly. Uh, in the policy direction document itself, we did uh, identify that around these 50 lakes, there are about 2,000 developed properties and there are about 430 vacant properties. Um, unless Jim corrects me, uh, these policies, if they're implemented, wouldn't restrict development on vacant lots. So we wouldn't be taking away their rights to build on a vacant lot. What may happen is that there may be additional restrictions on how much of a lot you can alter, how much of a lot you can use, and how much of your lot can be the site of docks and even to the point of restricting the number of dock slips or their length. The most significant impact will be on lot creation itself. Um, so, so those are the impacts that we see, but we're not looking to take away people's rights to build on their vacant lots, but we may add through this process additional restrictions on what they can do on those lots in particular to restrict the number of boats in some way uh, from accessing the lake. Uh, but it's a good discussion uh, and certainly one that we're looking forward to having when we get into uh, the policy itself. And as a follow-up to that, I'd also like to add this is a great discussion, um, but we're certainly interested in anyone's comments on whether the policy direction as we've written it needs to change. And up until now, the one change I think uh, there is some consensus on is that the official plan should contain a clear definition of what recreational carrying capacity is. And that's something we'd be happy to add to this policy direction so that we will be directed to do that when we come back to you. Uh, with the actual policy itself. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. I'm gonna let Mr. Clark have one more comment and then I'll see if I can bring us together to let you know, uh, Mr. McDonald, where to go with this. So hang on, Mr. Clark? Yeah, just last comment. I mean, I understand that we have a certain amount of lots that have been created and not built on. Have we done any kind of analysis of how many lots could further be created on these lakes and shouldn't that be part of that analysis? If I, if I can respond to that, I encourage you uh, to look at the background report where there's the table in the background report that talks about the, uh, the existing level of development. And I'm happy to provide uh, a copy of that table to anyone who's in this call now um, so they can look at it where we identified it. Um, we have not looked at potentially creating other lots because again, it's one tool in the toolbox. I can't say that you could create lots where it's all in front of fish habitat or where the oligotrophic uh, standards in the lake are, are something that need to be considered. There's too many other considerations. And one of the issues on the table is increasing the minimal lot frontage. So again, we'd be assuming too many things to look at potential creation of the lots. All of these things are very important to consider when um, lake uh, organizations are preparing their lake plans. And perhaps that's one of the ways that this works itself into the system. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mayor Harding, thank last, you. last word. Yeah, just a quick comment. And um, I think Nick made the comment, you know, that to some of these policies, depending on when we put them in play, will potentially require lots of minor variances. And, and just to trigger, if I don't meet the official plan, it's not a minor variance, it's an official plan amendment. So that's a very, very different process to get some things done here. And that's where I'm, I don't mind directional policies, but some of the hard caps might present a number of problems. Again, I'll take a small lake in this case, somebody's got a thousand feet that they bought years ago, their idea is they've got three kids and they wanna do three 300 foot lots for family and estate planning going for, forward. Are they really changing the use or are they spreading out the use, but everyone gets their own lot? And to go through an official plan amendment versus a minor variant is significantly different. And that's my concern as we move forward. So I just wanna make sure we're all aware of those implications. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I think what we, I think Mr. McDonald, yes, we need a definition for sure. 
And then as this is written, are we comfortable uh, as a majority going forward with this into our draft, knowing it's not permanent, we can talk about it then, et cetera. So uh, could I get a maybe uh, raised hands on who is willing to have this stay as it is? Is that up, Mayor Harding? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Madam Kirk? Yeah. I'm, I, okay, could everybody leave their hands up for with yes. a lot of to count? Seven, eight, ten. Well, I think we could. Uh, would you like me to ask for who's against it? Or are you good? That's not a... Yeah, it's not formal. Okay, so I think we're going to leave this as it stands for now, Mr. McDonald. I'm sure we'll come. I'm sure we'll come back to this again. So um, carry on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one down. Well, that's fantastic. All right. Uh, the next one in uh, the list uh, sent out by email by Mr. Pink uh, dealt with grandfathering, and that was policy direction uh, number nineteen. And just for the purposes of review, uh, I'm just gonna turn to that policy direction right now. And essentially uh, this policy direction sets the stage uh, for uh, no longer permitting, um, I guess, expansions and second stories of existing dwellings within uh, the setback area. Right now there is there are permissions in place uh, within the 20 meters to a certain point. Um, but if we move that 20 meters to 30, um, the, th the thinking is, at least in this policy direction, is that there would be no permission for expansions or second stories within that area either. Now, this can be a very involved discussion. Um, I, I can certainly appreciate that. Um, I'm also thinking that perhaps it's more for the zoning bylaw to talk about. However, uh, the official plan is what directs the zoning bylaw. So it's a very useful discussion to have. I think based on the feedback we've got through the consultation, there's a difference of opinion, quite frankly, on whether this is a good idea or not. Um, certainly those who feel that development further back in the lake uh, will support uh, the environment more. Uh, we've certainly heard that loud and clear, uh, but we know as many others do uh, that by doing this, we'll basically be creating hundreds if not thousands of non-conforming, non-complying buildings and structures all over the place. So that's obviously a concern. A related concern uh, that we've seen through the process to date is that the further back you push things on a property, uh, the more it means that other things may happen that are unintended, like blasting of rock, the taking down of trees in the back, and so on. And those are factors that need to be considered. So we've put that out there. We've got a mixed bag of opinions coming back. Um, and we're certainly happy to discuss it and see whether we should uh, maintain the policy direction as is or whether it should be modified. And we're in your hands uh, as a group to uh, get your comments in that regard. Thank you. Councillor Nishikawa? Thank you. I sort of should have asked this in the beginning, and I noticed that uh, someone else had asked as well. In the future, or could we do it now, could we start um, putting screen sharing some of these policies? Um, and the reason is, is that, you know, some of us, uh, we're trying to operate two computers at the same time and that type of thing. But essentially, I think it would be um, helpful if if we could screen share. I, I love looking at everybody's face and things, but I'd rather look at the words. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that makes it very difficult from this end in terms of voting, et cetera, if we're on screen share and we can't see everybody. That That is the one drawback of this. And so, Councillor Edwards? Uh, yeah, I think if, if you just give the, the number and the page number that you're on, we can follow it that way rather than jumping all over to rather than having to look through it. If you said it was uh, page number 18 for policy number 19, it would be fine. So I think that I think the answer is a, a hard copy. That's what I'm using beside me and just flipping to it whenever with whatever we're talking about here. 
So it's very difficult the other way, Councillor Nishikawa. Okay, uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we're back to policy direction number 19. There's two distinct uh, issues in this policy, and I'm just wondering if they shouldn't be separated. The first is uh, changing the setback, and the second is changing the, uh, the, the rebuilding rights uh, within the setback area. And I'm having trouble. Um, shouldn't those be considered separately? Because if, uh, if we don't change the setback, that probably influences how we would deal with the second part. But if we do change the setback, so I don't know how anybody else feels about that. Do you want to comment on that, Mr. McDonald? Uh, yeah, you know, I was thinking about that as well uh, because there are two separate points being made here and one is related to another policy direction and one isn't. Uh, so the other policy direction uh, dealing with enhanced uh, lake system health uh, makes the suggestion or sorry, it's another one, policy direction 17 actually, that makes the suggestion that there be a, an increase in the setback. So there are two things happening um, and we're open to splitting that out and having a conversation on that because we are saying, hey, let's, uh, let's remove the permission that currently exists. And uh, if we actually increase the, bio, increase the setback from 20 to 30, uh, perhaps we need to remove it there too. So I would agree in this case that there are two separate things we're talking about here. So I'm happy to split those out. So that would be the A and B would end up being 19A, 19B, for example. And then we can have a conversation on that. Okay, Councillor Jagowitz, do you want to comment on that if it's split? No, I have to think about it. Um, I, 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 I've very, got very mixed feelings on the uh, setback issue, to be honest. And I, I'd like to hear what other people uh, have to say. Okay, thank you. Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. And um, I, I agree they're, they're both separate discussions. Uh, I'll start with B first, 19B, and that's the 20 to 30 meter setback for new builds or existing builds. Um, I, I really don't. I, I'm not comfortable with literally making every single property in Muskoka Lakes legal non-conforming. Um, and, and what I find when we do this on a regular basis, well, you need to be more in conformity. So you wanna add a foot extension to a cottage or whatever, where you are today. Well, we prefer, and I've heard the conversation around this table for 12 years to be more in conformity. You need to move your whole cottage back to the 30 foot setback, which means we're taking down more trees, we're doing more destruction. Um, uh, you know, we all have various places where they, you don't wanna be a hundred feet back from the water, you wanna see the water. So we now start to limb trees, we cut down trees. Um, if, I, if I want a backwoods lot, I'm gonna buy a backwoods lot, but if I want a waterfront lot, so I'm, I'm really struggling with the 30 meter setback. And I think it's gonna cause us more issues and more headaches and more hassles as going forward. I would actually vote to remove that as a consideration right now going forward. I think we could save ourselves a lot of time and aggravation. The second area, which is actually point A, as far as the grandfathering, there've been a lot of developments that have happened, I'm gonna say 10 years ago and 15 years ago that caused a lot of grief. I think our zoning bylaw has actually addressed a number of that in our 2014-14, which allows for a 20% expansion only between 35 feet and 50 feet. And 20%, again, if I've got a thousand, an old, those old cottages were maybe a thousand square feet, I can add a 200 foot room in that setback and I can only raise my roof line 20%. So I, I actually think we got it right in 2014-14 and I'm not sure that we really need to be contemplating those changes here in our official plan. And I, I've said this again for 10 years, not new to this discussion. The more we redevelop into conformity and everybody goes to 60, six feet back and well, you're not, you're too close to the water. Let's go back. Let's go back. We end up with suburbia and part of our unique character. And we talk about that are some of the old unique properties that are built close to the water. I don't want to, remove all of those. I don't want to make Taj Mahal's on the water, but they add to some of the unique character. Anybody new lots, new builds, 
100%, that's where we go. But a modest 20% expansion, uh, I think is appropriate. And I actually like point C in this, that talks about establish a series of objectives and criteria for minor variances. I think we can solve a lot of the problems with looking at C in particular. So that's my perspective. I actually think we've already addressed A in our zoning bylaw and I would not be looking at B. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Uh, I would also like to add that in our bylaw right now, grandfathering the 20% between the 30 to 50, uh, if it's an addition, I have no problem with it. If you're demolishing what is there, you should be required to move back. And I think that that was something that was left a little gray in our area. As far as moving it back to the 30 meters, I think you're going to run into all sorts of problems there. You're gonna find people are now putting their septics in front, which is now making them closer to the water. And I think if I'm a hundred, if I'm a hundred feet back at a cottage and I wanna enjoy the water, I am now moving everything down to the waterfront. So now waterfront is now my main concern and that's where all my parties are gonna happen. That's where my washroom is going to be. That's where my picnic table is going to be. Everything's gonna be down there so I don't have to walk back and forth to my house. So I would not support the 30 meter setback. And as for C, um, yeah, I, I believe that should be included. I just want to make a quick point about uh, septic systems and leaching beds. There already is a requirement for them to be 30 meters back uh, from the waterfront. So they would not be in front of the cottage or between the cottage and the lake in any case. Uh, but that, and that's a current uh, provision uh, in the township. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I also, you know, putting my contractor's hat on uh, and, and also noting the differences between the three big lakes that I would not be in favor of, um, of the 30 feet, 30 meter uh, setback the way that we, but I, I am concerned uh, much like Danelda had raised that with the 20%, uh, we have seen, I have seen situations where um, people did a total rebuild, uh, you know, and forgiveness and all of those other things come into play, but a massive cottage ended up getting built on these small. And I look at Lake Muskoka in particular, because um, there we have so many small lots and so many small cottages and those cottages are being redeveloped still today and sometimes 30 feet close to the water. Uh, and they're, they're somehow getting around things and I'm not sure how it's working, but they're getting around things. Uh, and sometimes without building permits. And then of course there's the whole bylaw issue that we need to talk about late down the road. Um, but I, 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 I am a little bit concerned that um, I almost feel like I wanna look at this as three different lakes or three different possibilities because you know lake joe has years ago it was put in place that there was a 400 lot requirement for instance and uh, we had different policies for many many years ago for lake muskoka for instance that um, filtered over but i'm just wondering if there's some way we can actually look at those those other lakes that have more development capacity left I'm guessing, <laughs> uh, that, that if there could be a different policy per lake, I guess that, that's where I want, wanted to go. Mr. Donovan, did you want to jump in there? Well, I'm just hearing a, a bit of a common thread here that there is some threshold at which the rebuilds should be required to meet the, the standards of the day. Am, am I reading that correctly? I'm seeing lots of people nodding. So as a policy direction, I mean, we could include a provision saying that the, the official plan should contain a threshold at which um, 
all new development or redevelopment um, shall meet the current standards of the day. And I'll just tell you, I'm working on a little project in King Township and their old zoning bylaw says if you rebuild more than 50%, you have to meet all the new bylaw requirements. Not a bad rule. Well, I, I, I don't know if we want to jump from the topic we're on right now, but I, I, I think we need to add that onto our list to talk about because I suspect you're going to get a lot of uh, um, agreement on that. But we'll, we'll finish this one off. Um, um, Member Thompson? Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I struggle with this a bit myself, but I keep coming back to what our goal is. And I think we've you know, heard loud and clear through the OP process that people want to protect our lakes and want to protect the environment and make sure that future generations can enjoy what we enjoy. And there's lots of science and literature that exists that identify certain minimum standards for ecosystem health. And, you know, for example, Environment Canada is now saying that 100 foot or 30 meter setbacks are advised on waterfront areas. And they're also recommending 30 meter vegetation protection zones in waterfront areas. So, you know, do we listen to that advice um, or do, or do we just, do we say, um, you know, how do, how do we factor that in to the idea that if people have to move their current cottages back, then you're taking down even more trees and maybe that's even worse for the environment. You know, so there's gotta be a balance and a trade off there somewhere. But I think that the, the general overall advice now from scientists is further back is better maintaining more of what you can in the first 30 meters is the preferred option. Maybe if you've, with respect to the grandfathering, if you already have a cottage, then maybe you can expand that a little bit and maybe you can put your second story on because that doesn't take down any more trees. Um, but, uh, but to say that, you know, we're not gonna do this because it's you know, an administrative burden I don't think that's the right answer. I think that there's ways around that, you know, which I think, you know, I think 19C was meant to, to start tackling that. But um, I think we need to do what the science says is the right thing to do and, um, and think carefully about the implications and how we can ensure that we're not doing something worse for the environment. I hope that was clear. It was. Uh, Member Lundell? Yes, I, I fully support what Member Thompson just said. Um, also, I, I did feel in the public session, I heard a lot of confusion amongst some of the people in my group. The people who were most vocal, and there were two out of the nine who did speak up, um, were concerned about being able to replace the size of the cottage that they already had. So, in a, you know, we have wood rot and whatnot. If they had to rebuild, they were concerned that they wouldn't be able to rebuild in their existing site. And um, I, I don't think that a lot of uh, owners were clear on that. They felt that that might decrease the value of their property. Uh, I think anybody involved in real estate right now knows that our property values are not decreasing. Um, it's been a very busy summer and there's a lot of people who want to be here and they want to be here because they enjoy the wonderful clean water. And uh, the water is also my family's drinking water. So anything that we can do to support um, our lake system health. And if that means we don't grandfather uh, large uh, rebuilds, um, I'm in support of that. I'd like to clarify a, a couple of things based on the comments made. Uh, firstly, uh, with respect to rebuilding exactly what you have, uh, there's nothing we can do to prevent that from happening. The Planning Act uh, provides for that, and there's no way the township can say you cannot rebuild exactly what you have. So that's certainly not something we're trying to get at. I also want to make it clear that when we talk about changing the 20 to 30, we're talking about new construction. So if there is a vacant lot or a newly created lot, that would be the new standard for that lot. And that's the 20 to 30. I think where we're getting a little confused perhaps, and, and this may be because of the way we put this together, is now we're talking about the grandfathering based on whether it's 20 or 30 meters. And I think the point was made is that, well, there's a, there's a setback discussion for new, discussion, uh, new construction that we need to have, and that's policy direction 17. That's pretty discreet because that's just new construction, new law creation, that's it. Uh, what we're talking about now is to what extent we grandfather what's there 
uh, in regards to whatever setback we establish. So if it stays at 20 meters, what should we allow people to do within that 20 meters if they have an existing existing buildings within that area? If it's 30 meters, what should we do? And that's perhaps where we perhaps confuse the conversation. But so I just wanted to make it clear that the 30 meters is new construction only. And I think that if we do that in the end, we have to have some rules that recognize existing development and allow for some redevelopment without having everybody to push back. That's just my view. So I think we're talking about how to make that work. I'm also going to suggest that this is probably a, a, a more detailed discussion that we can get to in a policy direction uh, at the policy direction phase, but uh, uh, because there are many ways to get at it. Um, so the principle is with respect to the setback, should it be changed for new construction only? Yes, no, that's policy direction number 17. Policy direction 19, uh, whatever that setback is, should we continue to allow uh, some uh, modest uh, expansions and second stories within that, within that area? Yes, no. And if it's yes, we'll come back with some ideas when we write the policies on what those thresholds are and we can have a further discussion on it. If the prevailing view is that there should be no permissions for grandfathering within whatever the setback is, well, that's the direction. Uh, that's a possible direction as well. I'm not hearing that uh, to this point around the table. So uh, perhaps not. that's not where we're gonna be ending up. I hope that assists in the conversation. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. So I've got three more people who want to speak and then maybe we'll just run through those options and see if we can get some sort of a consensus. Uh, Member Clark. So I haven't found anybody um, other than a couple of people on this call that would be in favor of going to a hundred or a hundred foot setback or 30 meter setback. Um, I think the environmental argument, I think we're all happy to go down that path. And I think we're all supportive of that. There's lots of ways to do that. We talked about uh, watershed studies. We've talked about water quality studies. We've talked about a lot of different ways to be able to do that on an individual basis, lot by lot. Um, finally, um, I guess responding to uh, Councillor Nishikawa, you know, we're never going to stop people from not going and getting building permits. I mean, we all know it's wrong. We have to enforce it, whether we, you know, go as harsh as telling people to go tear things down or whatever. That's a bylaw issue. That's an enforcement issue. Um, when you start changing uh, people's property rights, what I heard on, on all of the public input calls that I was on, which I wasn't at the first one, but the second, people aren't happy when you start changing their rights. And our current, and I think Patricia has said this as well, um, what I would say is when you start talking about only allowing a 20% increase in both height and size, um, the reason you're seeing new cottages being built between that 35 and 50 feet is nobody does just 20% in size and in height because they'd be the weirdest looking cottages you've ever seen in your life. Um, what they're doing is they're adding 20, a room of 200 feet at the front and at the back of the cottage, they'd have to add whatever other amount they want and they'd end up with two story things there and, and just bizarre architecture. So you don't see any of those and you don't see any of those because we all end up going in for the minor variance or zoning bylaw amendment process and just clog that all up. And I think right now we're probably looking at, you know, February or March to go talk to somebody about this. By the way, when you go in to talk to somebody uh, in planning, when we used to be able to do that, they'd all gather around the table because they'd all have to try and figure out what our current bylaw is, which you know, part of our whole process is to supposedly try and help David and his group out to make these things easier. And they're all sitting there with calculators trying to determine what the heck somebody can build. So, um, you know, I, I, I think the 30 meter back is a no brainer. My understanding is this was brought up a couple of years ago and it didn't go anywhere. Um, I think all of you have uh, a large number of constituents that only have lots that are 100 feet deep. So where's their septic going? Guess what? Minor variance. So, um, you know, uh, it's way more complicated and, and the current bylaw isn't right either. It's complicated. So it definitely needs to be looked at. Okay, thank you. Uh, member, uh, member Arnie. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Bridgman. Um, I personally would like to see the 30 uh, meter setback, but I've lived here long enough. I've been on council, I've been on planning, and I appreciate uh, the comments, the difficulties that it will present for many of the lots that we have. I now go back to something that didn't come up in uh, discussions, and that was the community permit uh, planning. And I think, to be perfectly honest, and I'm certainly not making David and his department's job any easier, but I think that's where we need to go because we need to be looking at these lots, these situations as, as they are, as, as they exist on the lake, as they exist on the land. If pushing it back 100 uh, feet means you have to blast out uh, half of the lot, then of course, it's ridiculous. But it, um, it, if the front of the, the lot tends to be uh, flood, um, it, attraction, um, then, you know, that's, that's a big consideration. So I'm, I'm going to back off on the 30 meters, even though part of me desperately thinks that our lakes need it. Um, but I really look to the community planning permit uh, system to build in something that encourages that along the way. Sorry, David. Okay, Mayor Harding, and then we're going to take a 10, uh, 10 minute break. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and just to circle back again on the 20 to 30, the other thing that happens, even if we put this technically on new lot creation, any good lot that's level and flat and easy has already probably been developed. What has not been developed in the new lot creation are those with cliffs and topography issues and everything else that are going to compound variances or official plan amendments as we move forward. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the only blank shoreline I look at across from me is that of a 30 meter cliff. So I'm up 30 and now I'm back 30 and, uh, you know, trying to get down to the water, it's going to be difficult. Uh, I agree with uh, Lori Thompson again, that I'd some ability to expand where you are. And, and again, if listen to Bob Clark, if we need to tighten up or refine our zoning bylaw, which does allow for little bits of 20% here, up or wide, I think that is appropriate. But if we can fix the language in it, then let's fix the language in it. Um, and uh, so I just, uh, I, again, the 30 meters is really scary. I think we're just causing more problems. And the other thing being, we've got really good water quality. Let's attack the problems differently. Let's talk about hardscaping. Let's talk about hard paths. Let's talk about, let's, let's put a percentage allowed for fire pits and walkways, sports courts, and all of that over and above the 10% lot coverage. Let's start including that to get a new number. You get 10% of your thing, and then you get another 3% for hardscape that gets you to another finish line. Like, let's just think about the finish line of environment and water quality that we want to get to. But again, when I've got to take away my grandfather cottage and move it now 100 feet back, we're probably doing more negative harm than allowing a 20% expansion. Okay, thank you. Um, so Mr. McDonald, could I suggest we take maybe a 10 minute break and then your, your three yes, no questions. Let's go back and review them and see if we can give you uh, direction on that. Sounds like a great plan, thank you. Okay, okay, we're back in 10 everybody.
right now, and I have eight. them right hey everybody it still says 22 participants but they're not right so if everybody could come and just come back on screen for a minute so we know you're back for our quorum please thank you okay i think we're we're uh, good to carry on so mr mcdonald um why don't you take us through these next uh, few steps Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So I think we've been talking uh, about policy directions 17 and 19 as they relate to the setback to uh, the lake. And I'll just switch, flip over to policy direction number 17 first. And this is the first yes, no question. 17A on page 16 uh, of the document uh, indicates include policies that direct updated zoning bylaw to increase the setback from 20 meters to 30 meters. And I guess we're looking for a yes or no in terms of that staying in the document. And I'll stop there and then we'll see where we go. Okay, so it is currently in the document. So if you want it to stay in the document, say yes. If you want it out of the document, say no, just so we're clear. Uh, okay, all those saying yes, We have five, six. So, okay, so that is, and those opposed. Are you counting eight? Okay, eight opposed. And so uh, I guess we are dropping the 30 meters back. All right, then we'll move back to policy direction number 19 and in particular uh, 19A. Um, and it says include policies that require the zoning bylaw to be updated to no longer permit the expansion of buildings or the addition of a second story within the currently required 20 meter setback from the lake. I'll have something else on what could happen in that setback in a few moments, but I, we need to get the yes, no to this first. So, so I guess to, to your previous point, should it stay in or should it come out? So if we're voting yes, we're going to have it stay in that there will be no permits to do any expansions or put a second story on. That's correct. Okay. Just, just so we're all clear. All right, those in favor of leaving that in, so there's no, no changes allowed. One, two, three, four. But, but Susan's not sure. <laughs> Would you like Sorry. clarification? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. If you could clarify again exactly what it is that we are. We are voting on whether we are going to basically say that there are no changes allowed on grandfather properties that um, uh, uh, to to expand or put a second story on, right within the twenty meter setback. That's correct. Are you good? Wow. You look like you're still confused. Well, um, it's, it's, it's less confused, and I guess I keep coming back to some good points have been brought up uh, um, throughout this entire process. And it does feel a little bit like there's science, there's evidence. We're asking today whether or not we're putting something in or not. I think that um, one of the things one of my colleagues has mentioned, and I think it was uh, Councillor Hayes, the intention of the complete rebuild. And, and so I guess what I'm trying to make sure is if we take something out completely, I want to make sure we're solving the problems that are really in front of us, at least as I understand them. So if, if we're saying we don't want to allow people to be able to build as it is today, and or is it to take, to, it's the workarounds, I guess, that I'm trying to make sure that we address. So it's the complete teardown of something and a complete rebuild in the same footprint. I just want to make sure that that's what, not what we're talking about here. I, well, maybe Mr. McDonald could correct me, but no, you're, you are allowed to 
replace exactly what you had. We have no control over that. Am I correct, Mr. McNaught? Yes, you, that, that's absolutely correct. All we're uh, asking now is whether we should leave the policy direction in that would no longer permit any expansions within the 20 meter setback area at all. Okay. So you can't alter anything that was original, basically. That's correct. Um, Councillor, I think Councillor Jackson actually has a co comment. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I. I'm. I, I think we have to be clear here what we're voting for. I do too. Uh, um, right now, there's a there's a twenty percent increase that you can have. So I, I'm not going to vote that a person can build any size in there. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to vote they can't do anything. So so maybe you have to define it better. That, that's a good point. And I, I guess where I was, I was trying to sort of compartmentalize maybe too much here, uh, because my next point would be, uh, should we uh, include policies that further restrict or, uh, or, uh, or develop a more rigorous threshold than the current uh, system that, that is in place about the 20% expansion and 20% going up? That's a very detailed discussion, probably more detailed than we can have here. Um, so that's why I was trying to compartmentalize. So if, for example, we, uh, you, you all collectively decide that no, there should be some permissions retained for uh, expansions and second stories within the 20 meter setback area, then the next question is, well, do we want to be more restrictive if that's the case in that area? And if so, we will go away and come back with some ideas for you to think about when we write the policies. Um, Mayor Harding, I think you have a comment before we... Yeah, so I, I guess, and uh, just as a perspective, so the question on the table is, do we want to freeze all development inside of 20 meters? My simple answer to that is no. Do we want to discuss the 20% increase, increase um, from height or width? Absolutely, I'm happy to have that discussion going forward. And the only question I'm going to ask is that, is it an official plan policy, that 20% expansion, or should we be dealing with it potentially in the zoning bylaw going forward and almost be silent at this particular point in the official plan? So uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of keeping this in and freezing all development south of 20 right now, but uh, going forward, happy to have the discussion. And again, I'll just look to Nick and say, do you want to have it in the official plan or what is it probably better suited in the zoning bylaw and updating that? Uh, my sense, Mayor Harding, it's a, a much better discussion to have in the zoning bylaw. But what I'm going to suggest is that when we come back with policies, we should further discuss it to see if there's any direction we want to include in the official plan on that point. But I think we can go no further today than, than, than agreeing on whether we should or should not permit uh, grandfathering within the setback area. That's really the question. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Edwards. Uh, I think there should be some uh, uh, exceptions, but you know, if you're, and that some of these cottages are five or 10 feet from the water, then they, they should be frozen at that. As, as you move, move back towards the 66 foot setback, then you know, you, you, you can have it. Um, you know, when a lot of these, these cottages were uh, built in the early 1900s and that, we didn't have all the environmental concerns because there might've only been a, a thousand uh, cottages on, on all three lakes. Now you've got thousands of cottages and it does have an impact. So, you know, we should be looking into that. So I think it should be left in and let um, it uh, go to, uh, to the public and, and see what other, other comments they, they have in there. Okay. That's just my comments. Oh, yep. and, and one other thing. Um, Sometimes a, a boathouse or, or a cottage is, 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 is taken down or a building taken down. It's sat just maybe with a pad for five or 10 years, somebody else buys and says, well, we're allowed grandfathering. And that should not be the case. Uh, I don't know how, how we can get around that with the uh, provincial policy statement. But once a building uh, and that comes down, it's down for a while, then it should not be allowed to, to uh, be re rebuilt. Is that even possible with the 
David, do you want to take that? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think that's less of a provincial policy statement. Uh, it's more of a legal matter that is unfortunately out of our hands. If uh, the courts determine that uh, the intention was to replace that, it, it retains its uh, legal non-conforming status and we wouldn't uh, be able to prohibit uh, uh, its replacement. Um, it needs to demonstrate that its uh, continuous use ceased, at which time, yes, it would lose it at that point. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's largely a case-by-case -case basis, sometimes dealt ultimately by the courts if needed. Um, it's, it's not a, sort of a policy uh, type issue. Thank you. Follow-up, Councillor Edwards. So as, as uh, and that um, uh, Director Pink said that uh, if it's, uh, a use has ceased, if it's been ceased for three years and then somebody else buys the uh, property and that we should have a, a good leg to stand on that it wasn't meant to be rebuilt. And that uh, uh, just, just, just my comments. And I think I would, uh, and that let the uh, courts uh, decide that, but I would not, not be allowing it. Okay, I think that's out of a uh, good point, but I think we'll move on with our, um, with our, so I have, I have two more comments and then maybe we'll, we'll have our straw poll again on this. Uh, Member Clark? Yeah, just um, definitely not for, uh, you know, ending grandfathering, but getting clear rules and regulations around it would be helpful to all of us. And um, I, you know, I don't know what the right numbers are. I think that that's a, that would be a good discussion for us to have, but I mean, you know, just something to think about if somebody, and probably might be more palatable to people is, you know, maybe it is the 20 and 20 if you're within the 35 uh, feet, but if you decide to go uh, greater than 50% of your footprint, um, you automatically have to move the entire building back to 50 feet. And beyond that, you have to take it down and go right to the 66 feet. And I think, I think that what that would do is it would give clarity to people as far as explaining what their options are. Because frankly, I think we all agree most of the places that we're trying to add 20% to, whether it's in height or in size, it, it's just not workable. It, it, you know, they're smaller cottages. It, it, it doesn't work. And they, that's the problem. They all go to minor variants. And then it's really stuck in council's lap to try and figure out, you know, how they're going to deal with those individual properties instead of really having a bylaw that should be something we can just all explain to a client or a cottager or a current property owner, right? Yes, good points. Uh, Member Lundell. Um, thanks. And thanks for raising that, Bob. Um, are we clear that then if this policy direction stays in, wouldn't all owners still be able to go for a minor variance if the change is deemed to be minor and it meets the test of being a minor change? That is correct. If we direct the zoning bylaw to say no to grandfathering in the setback area, then anyone uh, would then have the opportunity to apply for a minor variance to, to achieve that objective. Right now, they wouldn't because there are built-in permissions to do certain things without requiring a variance in the setback area. So if I could ask a question then, so can the 20% expansion be part of a minor variance? I would uh, defer to Mr. Pink on that, but I think anything in a zoning bylaw that sets a standard of any kind can be varied through that process. Mr. Pink, would you mind? Because I'm curious. Yes. Um, sorry. I think uh, certainly we do currently receive a lot of minor variance applications for the front yard. Uh, we do currently allow 20% uh, larger, 20% higher, and a lot of applications look to seek to go beyond that. So I think the question really uh, before you uh, is whether um, you want to. Uh, really eliminate that ability altogether and any expansion, 1% uh, would need a variance or whether uh, we look to maintain some flexibility and we can have further debate about, again, what the appropriate percentage is or the threshold uh, or the criteria that we would look at to, to approve of a minor variance. Uh, so I think those are the two options I believe uh, before you. 
Thank you. We have lots more people who would like to say something here, Mr. McDonald. <laughs> so, okay, uh, Member Thompson. Okay, I'll just be quick. I mean, there are there are lots of smaller cottages close to the waterfront, um, as uh, Mr. Clark said, but there are also large cottages that have already taken advantage of the grandfathering rights and someone else comes along and buys it and says, oh, now I can increase it by another 20%. And someone else comes along and buys it and says, oh, now I can increase it by another 20%. What do our, our bylaws speak to that? Because that's where you get the creep. And that's where I think you really do need to look at the science and what's appropriate for building close to the waterfront. Okay, I'm going to ask somebody to answer that for me. Maybe. David, can you answer that question about it being cumulative? He's just, I believe he's just looking it up here. So yes. Thank you, just needed to refresh my memory. I'm a little uh, removed from the, the finer details, but yes, we made sure when we updated in 2014-14, uh, it was as of the date of the bylaw. So you would not be able to continuously, um, essentially roundabout way of uh, getting past the rules by continuously doing it in separate constructions. Um, so it is not a cumulative 20%, it would be a one time. Uh, permission. Thank you. Um, Mayor Hardy. Thank you. And just for clarity to understand there's two, one question, one comment. So, but if we put a policy in our official plan that does not allow any expansion in under 20 meters, then it's not just a zoning bylaw amendment, then it's also an official plan amendment, is it not? So that's question number one. I, I know that policy to direct the thing, but if the policy is actually stated that it can't be done, then we may be in an official plan amendment to allow for that. So I, I see I'm nodding my head and I'll let you answer that quickly. But I guess the other way that we may wanna creatively look at this that allows certain expansion, I agree, if, I, if there's only so much cottage and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, is there a new metric that could be put in place here that says, you know, we know we're allowed a 10% lot coverage within the first 200 feet. Maybe we only allow a 3% lot coverage in the first 50 feet. As another metric to put involved with this that may potentially solve the problem automatically for us. And also then restrict development super close to the shoreline, which is what we're all trying to do. So I don't know how that metric would look. It's something I don't think we've ever contemplated, but those are the kinds of things to address it versus saying, I've got a thousand square foot cabin, I wanna put a 200 room on it. And we say, no, absolutely not. You gotta move the thing 66 feet back. I don't think that in my opinion would be what I call good planning or good environmental stewardship. So Nick, maybe we can help. Yeah, so in answer to the first question, uh, yes, if we include a policy in the plan that says no expansions permitted, uh, theoretically, an official plan amendment would be required uh, to allow that to happen. However, the policy can also be written in a way that says no amendment is required, but you have to go through a minor variance and here are the criteria and considerations that need to be considered. Similar to a previous discussion uh, we, we, we had on that point. And, and we're having a really good discussion on ways we can manage how we allow for grandfathering. And I'm going to suggest that it goes way beyond the policy directions and perhaps even the policies themselves in the official plan, but clearly it's a valuable discussion to to have. And I'd like to take us back to whether we should continue with grandfathering, yes or no, and then we can certainly move on to other topics. Okay, thank you. So maybe that's the easier way to state this. Are we, are we in favor of, well, maybe I better, read, I better start with what A says. Everything is frozen. There is no, no grandfathering, no, no um, variances allowed at all on on these waterfront properties. Who is in favor of that? Um, let me clarify before Thank I you. proceed. Uh, there's no as of right grandfathering. Variances are always permitted. Um, so it's, it's taking away the as of right grandfathering. That's what we're suggesting. Thank you. All right, so all those in favor of taking away the as for right grandfathering. Well, I one, two, a two, I believe. 
Oh, did, did she? All right, three. So, so, all right. I think that's your answer on that one, Mr. Sure. McDonald, the next one. Okay, um, so I'm gonna follow uh, Mr. Pink's list and, uh, and perhaps this will be a short discussion, but it's policy direction 15 dealing with short-term rentals. And that is on page 15 of the uh, policy direction document. And the policy direction is very simple. Uh, the OP should include policies that enable the establishment of a licensing, licensing system for short-term rental accommodation. And as I mentioned in the earlier sessions, we don't need an official plan policy to provide the basis for a licensing system. And that was mentioned last time. And the idea of this group was to put it out there to see what folks were thinking about short-term rentals generally and whether they thought licensing was a good idea. Uh, I'll again, re I'll again re uh, restress that fact that we don't need to have this policy in the official plan. Someone suggested earlier on that perhaps we take it out. I would be okay with that as well. So I'm in your hands in terms of how you wish to proceed. Thank you. I, I actually don't see anything uh, negative about leaving this in as a possible direction. It just leaves our options open and it's there. So that's, that's my thought on it. Member Clark? I agree with exactly what you just said. I, don't, I think the jury's out and generally we should be able to deal with it with zoning by, or, um, by law enforcement, but we should keep our options open. Okay, thank you. Member Harney, Arnie. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Yes, I, I would agree with that. The, the two sides um, for and against are equally violent um, and adamant. So I think we might as well come up with a policy and, and fight it out uh, at that stage again. So leave our options open. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hayes. By including this in the OP, uh, that doesn't bring any policies forward. It just says that we allow policy to be developed, but uh, a licensing policy would not require to have the approval of the official plan. So you're approving something that's a moot point because it's approved anyway. So I think by leaving it in, you're moving a discussion from a committee that should be struck to look specifically at this and uh, using up time that we should be doing, looking at uh, official plan information rather than something that's going to be done outside the official plan. Mr. Diamond, I see you like to speak. If I can just weigh in for a second. In my view, there's been enough public comments and responses to questionnaires and things dealing with the short-term accommodation thing that to not at least have something in the official plan about it now will leave some people saying I said something but no one listened to me um, and it is just enabling it's not compelling it's always helpful to state that the municipality is interested in it and again it, it shows that you are listening to what people are saying to you Oh, Member Lundell. Um, I just have a question for our consultants again. I've been following what's happening in Seguin Township, and they're talking about changing and adding a new phrase of short-term accommodation to the zoning bylaw. And then through the zoning bylaw, permitting it, but I guess uh, limiting um, how short the short-term can be. And right now they're looking at four weeks. So do we have to have it in our official plan in order to have something like that in our zoning bylaw? Uh, in, in my opinion and in response, no, uh, you don't have to have something in your official plan to provide that ability in the zoning bylaw. I would caution, however, zoning is a very inflexible tool. Um, and while that could be included in a bylaw, it is very difficult to enforce uh, because in order to inspect the premises, you have to be pretty sure there's an infraction going on. And that's very, very difficult with short-term rentals. That's why licensing, in my opinion, is much preferred over zoning. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pink would like to say a few words. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to add to that, uh, yes, enforcement 
uh, regulating a, a certain period of time would be extremely difficult. The other issue that I find would be extremely difficult that would render a zoning by ineffective is uh, legal non-conforming rights. Every existing rental could legally continue even if we put in our zoning bylaw all had to cease immediately. Um, and it would be extremely difficult for the municipality to prove that it wasn't a rental in the past. Um, and I suspect a lot are. So you wouldn't be solving any problems um, by doing it uh, really that way. Hence, all of our investigations have led to the uh, either bylaw enforcement or licensing route as opposed to uh, the zoning bylaw route. Although I wish Segment all the best. Hmm. Okay, um, Member Escalati. Yes, I just wanted to agree with what Mr. Diamond said. I think that the public expects us to be paying attention to this issue. It's really a hot button issue and I think we need to leave it in there so that future councils could uh, take advantage of it if need be. Thank you. Okay, so can I have a, um, is there anyone opposed to leaving this in the official plan? Okay, Councillor Hayes, you're true to your word, <laughs> but that uh, that stays in. Okay, Mr. McDonald. All right, so now I'm going to follow the list that I created at the beginning, and I'll start with uh, some of the policy directions that Member Arney uh, brought up in an email. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, and perhaps uh, Member Arney can then speak to uh, her concerns or her suggestions with respect to these. Um, I'm going to lump three of them together because I believe that's how Member Arney uh, dealt with them. Policy Direction 8, 10, and 11. Um, policy Direction 8 dealt with intensification. Policy Direction 10 dealt with rural law creation. And Policy Direction 11 dealt with attainable housing. And if I got this right, Member Arney, uh, you were asking the question about how the township will be responding uh, potentially to there being increasing demand for development as a consequence of the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I apologize if I didn't get that exactly correct. Uh, perhaps Member Arney, you can uh, further elaborate on your, on your thoughts there. Through you, Chair uh, Bridgman. Thank you, Nick. I think you captured it quite well. Um, just if David or uh, one of the consultants could remind me, is it district policy that there can be no um, development off public services, uh, subdivision or, or small housing developments? Or is that um, like that? That's our policy right now. I'm concerned that there is a demand. I, I have a close friend who's a real estate agent. What they are selling right now is incredible and the demand is increasing. And I'm wondering if when we, when we did 8, 10 and 11, did we really think about being able to meet that demand effectively? I don't think that's a place, this is the place for that discussion um, because it really goes back to all three of them completely. But I just ask a uh, committee to think about it as we're going forward because some of our restrictions are pretty restrictive and we might want to consider opening up a little more development within the township uh, as we go forward in the next five years or at least control it somewhat better. So I thank you for that opportunity to, uh, to discuss that or present that. Um, Mr. Pink, do you want to answer the, the districts and our policies on that? Uh, Mr. McDonald may wish to add, I'm sorry, I may have missed a, a bit of the question, but uh, generally the district official plan would discourage um, higher density development in our in our rural area, as would we um, state uh, lots uh, or state subdivision, that type of uh, development, although the PPS has recently changed and I would say open that door up uh, a crack uh, a little bit again. Uh, it was more restrictive previous and it has, uh, like I say, loosened um, their language a little bit in the latest update. 
I, I would agree with uh, Mr. Pink. Uh, Again, I, yes, my comments relate to unserviced uh, rural right. or, or unserviced community uh, development, not uh, uh, certainly the policies of the district would uh, look to intensify in our urban settings where municipal water and sewer services are available. Okay, um, uh, Councillor Hayes. Just so that you know, our Attainable Housing Committee is going forward on the policies that currently exist. So if you change anything in there, we need to know because we're looking at uh, uh, tiny homes, different septic um, way, ways of handling septic. So we're going forward with that. But also at a meeting this morning, uh, we have heard that the provincial policies may be changing on um, apartment buildings and things like that on rural areas, because there are so many municipalities that are mostly rural, they may not even have water and sewer at all. And uh, this is going to be something that we're going to be discussing at our attainable housing committee meeting tomorrow under new business. So, so we should keep each other apprised because we're going ahead and we don't want to run into you and have issues with our own policies. Okay, sounds good. Um, um, Mr. Diamond, did you want to make a comment? Uh, just to follow up from the last one, and hopefully not to be accused of having a foot in two different canoes. Um, the uh, District Housing Task Force is going to be providing recommendations to the uh, area municipalities uh, regarding policies and zoning provisions to try to encourage attainable housing in the district. And I anticipate those recommendations to be made next spring. Um, and it should be a consideration as we go through this process. And as disclosure, I sit as a volunteer on that task force. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Nishikawa. Sorry, thank you. I, I think I wanted to raise um, uh, much along the line what that Donelda was mentioning. And, you know, attainable housing is a whole different animal than being able to create lots that are affordable. So, and, and the reason why I bring this up is, is transportation is a huge part of the discussion when you're sitting around a, the district table discussing um, the needs of, 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 of rental accommodations or basically housing. So transportation has got to be part of the discussion um, when, when you're talking about, like, for instance, the attainable housing grants and those types of things. There, there's another little division that, that in fact, lot creation for, um, I don't know what you want to call it anymore, because I just watched a house that, norm, that sold for two, uh, two years ago for 200000 sell for $600,000. i am i am just shocked that young people will not be able to afford to live in Muskoka any further if this continues but um uh, it, it's that creation of um of a, a two and a half acre lot for instance uh and and making those more uh, available to others to to start out with uh, it, i guess is a whole different thing but i i also again our municipality has to look at transportation as well and when we're discussing a lot of these uh policies Okay, so I'm, I'm just, uh, I mean, I'm looking at these three policy directions and I, my sense is that we're all in agreement with moving in this direction. It would just, there's some other things we'd like to talk about at some point, a little more detail. Mr. McDonald? Um, I would uh, agree with that. Um, I would also note uh, that in policy direction 10, uh, which deals with uh, uh, rural uh, law creation, uh, we are suggesting that there be consistent policies applied, but we haven't suggested uh, up until now uh, what they actually will look like. So there will be room for that discussion when we uh, get to the policy direction or policy development phase. So I haven't heard anything that changes what we've got written here at this point. I agree. Now, I think Councillor Hayes would like to make a comment. Uh, yes, just in number 10 on the um, comments that you received from the um, it says here that uh, 
support for the direction of rural lot creation on non-arable lands. This I don't think should be there. The reason being is if you have someone who currently has a farm and is looking to sever off five acres to give his son so that he can live on the farm and keep um, helping out with it, it prevents that. And I, I don't know why. I know that you the intent is to not have development on lands considered agriculture, but I think that you can't just make a blanket statement that there would be no development, that there should be some kind of development allowed for generational um, investment into the land. Uh, in response to that, uh, that was a comment in the Lura document. It wasn't in our document. And I would note uh, that there is a separate policy direction on agricultural uses, policy direction number 13 on page 14, uh, which does speak to identifying and protecting agricultural areas and minimizing or restricting law creation in those circumstances. But it isn't clear in terms of whether it's minimize or restrict. And I think we can have that conversation uh, when we get to the policy writing component. Um, but uh, uh, certainly if you are in Southern Ontario, residential law creation is absolutely prohibited on agricultural land. Uh, so that's probably where that person or folks were coming from when they when those comments were made. Okay, Mr. McDonald, I think we can carry on. Right. Oh, so I see, excuse me, I see Councillor Edwards wants to make a comment. Uh, yes, I would, would not be um, uh, in, in favor of uh, taking rights away from, from somebody who has a hundred acre farm and gets his, his two lots. And that I seen that when I was on the uh, committee of adjustment in the Caledon, you know, you can't, as a farmer can't take a, a, a lot and you go down there now and there's a couple of hundred houses on there now the subdivision. So, uh, and that, and that's prime uh, agricultural land. So I would not be in favor of that. Uh, I would leave that one alone completely. And that, but that's just, just just my view. But you're taking rights away. We talk about on lakefront. Yet you you have someone a hundred acre farm. He can't take it off for his family. It's incredible. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McDonald. I think it's yours again. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next policy direction identified by Member Arnie. It was also identified by uh, Lori Thompson and also by someone else, I can't recall who, but that deals with flooding, policy direction number three. There was quite a bit of discussion on this policy direction and uh, through the process and certainly last time around, and I'm gonna ask member Arnie to speak to her concern and perhaps Lori can also speak uh, to what her suggestions uh, may be. I would note uh, that in this policy direction, uh, we are suggesting that the zoning bylaw do certain things. Um, so we're not uh, suggesting that there be standards included within the official plan to deal with some of the uh, issues that we've identified. So pro it's probably more of a discussion uh, when we get to the zoning bylaw. But I do understand that there uh, is, an, is a desire to discuss the use of the first story of boathouses. And this policy direction basically indicates that policy should be included or regulations should be included in the updated zoning bylaw to prohibit uses beyond the storage of boats and non-hazardous boating equipment in the first story of boathouses. And it's my impression that that's uh, what uh, uh, you uh, may wish to talk about. I could be wrong on that, but uh, if I am, please let me know. Uh, but perhaps you can speak to what your concern was and what you'd like to talk about. Thank Member you, Mr. Arnie. McDonald. Yep. Member Arnie. Thank you, through you, Chair Bertrand. Um, I guess to the group. My my concern is there is no reference in our policy direction that directs policy to ensure we develop standards to build back better. Um, there's lots of talk about boathouses, but there's really not much, there's no reference to the new district uh, floodplain mapping uh, being a basis for consideration of policies going forward. And there is no reference to 
build back better, both in terms of flooding and in terms of ice damage. There are calculations that uh, are out there for engineers that would enable boathouses to be built back better to withstand certain percentage of ice pressure, et cetera. So I, I think at least in our policy direction, I, I would like to see the build back better um, as a policy direction. And I would like to see a reference to the district floodplain mapping as a baseline for policies going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Scalati, Member Scalati. Yes, first, I, I agree with what uh, Patricia Arney uh, just laid out, but uh, my concern is uh, slightly different, and I'm not sure if it really belongs in an OP or somewhere else, but I'm concerned that some people are developing or building on areas unknowing that there is that they are building in the floodplain. And it would sure be nice if somewhere along the line, somewhere in the permitting process or the planning process that uh, somebody checks to be sure that they're not building or developing in a floodplain that's going to cause damage to their uh, property eventually. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you. And I, I, I don't mind any of the uh, floodplain stuff and hazards building in. I like some direction in there. Um, the one question we might want to ask ourselves is do we, and it's kind of difficult, but do we set an elevation of uh, boathouse and docks to the floodplain? So, but the reality is based on spring of 2019, every boathouse or every dock on Lake Muskoka would have to come up three feet. So, you know, you're jumping off the pier to go swimming or park your boat uh, on those kind of cases. And I, I don't think I appreciate the floodplain and, and buildings and stuff. Um, boathouses can potentially go underwater. The one policy that I'm asking questions or maybe some clarification on to include policies director up to design by law prohibit storage of any hazardous materials. So we would consider a jerry can of gas hazardous material or an oil filter for our boats. But 90% of the people may have a jerry can of gas in July and August in their boathouse. Is it the off season storage? Is it a policy in the springtime when I leave it unattended or that we don't allow unattended items to be included? And I think that's really the issue. And I go back to 2019 where we saw propane cylinders, we saw you know portable 9.9 .9 horsepower gas cans floating down the river. That hazardous material is an issue. But generally speaking, in June, July, August, September, when the water is extremely low and I decide to go into Port Carling and get three jerry cans of gas to put in my boat and leave those jerry cans in my boathouse, is that wrong? Or again, I have an oil filter or a liter of oil that I store up and above in my boathouse because my boat burns through oil. Um, that's where I'm trying to understand what hazardous materials in. Is it a year round policy or is it more of a spring flood policy? Mr. Diamond, it looks like you might like to chime in on that. Very much so. Um, I think that there's a couple of things I'd like to talk about. First of all, the district has new floodplain mapping that's easily to access online. It's very accurate. It's at a great scale. We uh, anticipate as part of the OP to make reference to that. And so it, it should be available to people. A lot of the things that we're talking about are zoning bylaw matters, but I will say that the policies in the OP will set the stage for site plan agreements, which could regulate timing of when jerry cans and batteries and oil filters can be kept in a boathouse if we're going to use site plan agreements for uh, boathouses. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that um, as David will have already told you that the, the law says you can rebuild in exactly the same position that your building was there in the first place. Um, but I don't think it's beyond the law to say if you do, um, and I've done it in many zoning bylaws, if you do rebuild, you have to flood proof if the building was damaged by flooding. And certainly a policy basis for that type of zoning regulation would be of great assistance for um, the environment that we're in. Okay, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. 
Um, it's interesting, and congratulations to the new friends of Muskoka Watershed, <laughs> um, Councillor uh, Kelly. Um, in discussions uh, in the past and, and uh, with the past chair, looking for best build discussions, it was actually raised to me that in fact, um, the better way to build a boathouse is to not attach it to the shore, to allow that buffer um, behind the boathouse so that essentially the water can flow around. Uh, and and I, I actually, the last time we built a boathouse, we did that essentially. Uh, we had the ability to do that. And again, some of the other best build practices, and I don't know if they can ever be put in a policy statement or anything else. And certainly this came out of the, the 2013 flood that we don't talk about as much anymore, but it was a very devastating flood for many, um, is that we did start raising. We, we have things high on shelves. All of those hazardous materials, those types of things, we just built shelves and, and people are, are more than happy to, to, uh, to do the best that they can do to prevent whatever damage that, that may happen um, when the lakes flood. So I, 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 I think some of those things that we could deal with, I'm not sure where we would deal with it. I, 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 I get the, some of it's zoning, some of it's, and some of it is just best, best practices, but I would like to, look at the idea that we might have to look at how boathouses are better positioned if they are actually healthier for the lake. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Thompson. I have a question for David Pink. If we don't attach a boathouse to the land, are we allowed to regulate it? Like if it's just out there floating like a boat? David? I mean, this is getting, that, that would get pretty scary, yeah, wouldn't it? It is classified as a vessel. You would not have authority to regulate it, uh, but we do regulate over the water. We do actually zone our lake beds, water body, open space, uh, and we do. And I think what uh, Councillor Nishikawa was uh, indicating, and I have reviewed, certainly not qualified to provide the opinion, but we review a large amount of environmental studies, fish habitat studies, and it's a fairly standard uh, recommendation from consultants that you do try to leave behind the boathouse open and actually push the boathouse offshore and connect it with preferably a narrow uh, walkway to get to the boathouse. Um, and council has debated that in the past. It's always a balance of, uh, there's a lot of neighborhood concerns when boathouses and docks extend too far out into the lake. So it's always been a challenge of finding that, uh, uh, that balance because the policy encouraging offshore would then push uh, boathouses further into the lake, which cross, causes other issues. Uh, but to ultimately answer your question, um, you know, again, depending on perhaps the length out and, and whether it's an actual floating uh, vessel, um, I think we have some possibility of, of regulating it. Thank you. Uh, Member Scalati. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Harding mentioned the words elevation in terms of uh, dock and flooding. And it's always uh, been a mystery to me what the term high water mark really means. Is that, the, is that the same as the floodplain edge? I don't think so. I think it, it tends to be defined by the surveyors that I've used as where the water is the day that they are there. And I, I just find that to be a very confusing term for people, and particularly if you're trying to build using the high water mark as, as a real mark. Uh, just on that particular point, I've had a lot of experience with high water mark uh, through my career and surveyors usually look, yes, at what's happening that day, but they are looking uh, at the edge of the, uh, of the lake to see where it's gone up and down and it's usually pretty visible so they can, they can make that out and it's usually the average high water mark that they use. However, it's not a perfect science. Uh, what will be happening though with the new floodplain mapping is that elevations will be the new way of doing things going forward uh, because that is much easier for any surveyor to figure out uh, and it is the same everywhere around the lake. So you'll have much more consistency in terms of how those standards are applied going forward. Um, so just my two cents on that point. Thank you. Um, Member Clark. 
just a handful of comments on this. Um, first of all, I can't remember attaching um, a series of docks or boat houses to the to the uh, to the shoreline. Most of them are built on uh, steel now. Um, that are uh, steel posts that are actually driven into the lake and they're independent. Um, obviously, we have to attach a walkway uh, to the um, to the shoreline for um, accessibility. But even in that particular case, it's generally um, you know uh, beams that are lying on the shoreline because docks do move. Um, so the more you start tying things down and making them firm, the more you have things sort of ripping themselves apart. Um, a few other just comments on some of the discussion around here. I think there was a uh, discussion about build things better. I mean, we are learning, um, you know, in lower boat houses, there's lots of people that don't even finish them. They're two by four studs. Um, and then there's lots of people that do finish them. And in those particular cases, um, we've learned put the electrical over three feet high, particularly on Lake Muskoka. In fact, we suggest over 48 inches. Um, fish cleaning stations, and I'll use that loosely. Um, we are using things like stainless steel cabinetry, et cetera, so that it's not leaching, et cetera, into the lake or, and they're attached. Um, appliances, if they're down there, um, they are removable. Um, on these higher end builds, I can tell you, there's $250,000, $300,000 of finishing in these lower levels of boathouses. They don't leave them unattended. They don't leave $50,000 of appliances, um, you know, to the elements or to water uh, approaching them. Um, septics are reviewed annually. I mean, the one thing you have to realize is that, um, you know, when you do these new applications, um, they become part of the septic, uh, uh, you know, review board and they come out annually. They look at the septic systems for the cottages and they look at the septic systems for the boathouses. And those systems are uh, sealed and self-contained. So, um, you know, we probably have a bigger problem with old boathouses with bathrooms in them versus uh, the new permits that are going out today. Um, also remember that these um, properties are now being leased back to us uh, or we can buy them. Uh, we can buy the lake bed, so we own it. Uh, so I don't know what kind of legalities uh, that provides. Um, the final thing I'd say is, you know, it probably behooves, so it doesn't seem to happen with the, um, with the ministry. Um, if we're issuing a new boathouse permit on the lakes, um, why don't we just have a damage waiver? Like, you know, you should insure it. It's your problem. It's not the township's problem. Um, these lakes are all floodplains and uh, build at your own risk and repair and rebuild at your own risk. Um, you know, that, I, I don't know if you could put that in your building permit application or, or when you uh, uh, provide a building permit, David, but that would absolve us of uh, uh, liability. And just the final comment, I know there's um, been some comment about finishing lower levels of boathouses uh, and, and utilizing them as lounges and stuff. Just straight out, I think Phil will uh, comment as well. That's what people want. I mean, that's what a certain segment of people want. And we build every day now. <laughs> and, um, and by the way, they get inspected, they get signed off and people use them. And I don't understand what the difference is, whether I'm sitting in the lower level of my boathouse on my dock or on its roof. Uh, so I, I just don't understand the complication around that discussion. And flooding isn't an answer because anybody who's building that isn't leaving their stuff in there. Okay, so I think I think that's beyond what we need from you today, Mr. McDonald. Um, yep. Councillor, excuse me, Councillor Mazan. Thank you, it's Ryu. Um, I did note. I think it's the last part of the policy direction requires site plan approval for every new or expanded boathouse. And I note that under the public comments that said some participants expressed concern for requiring it. Um, I wondered if we, if you could take a moment, is there a risk for us going down this path given, you know, if, if for that exact comment that was just brought up, if, if, there, if it's a known risk, we're, we're taking risk to build over a floodplain 
and then it's under a site plan approval process. I just wouldn't mind understanding, is this the home for that or is there a risk? Um, in response to that, I think, I think where that comment probably came from is a concern about there being additional regulation uh, that needs to be satisfied uh, through an agreement. Right now, there is no requirement for site plan approval for a boathouse. So this would be a new requirement. It will cost the proponent money. It will cost the proponent, proponent time. So that's where I think that comment was probably coming from. Uh, everything, everything else on a property is regulated through site plan approval, but boathouses have historically been exempt. So this would be a new practice of the township if this was uh, in, uh, actually implemented. Sorry, just to follow up on that, um, one of the things I note is it is a bit difficult when you're reading this when it says words like mixed, mixed reviews. Well, and it's hard to understand the balance mm. sometimes. Is that, you know, is it 80% of the people are saying one thing and you heard one or two people? Um, what I think I'm hearing from this is that that might have been coming from one or two people. The concern on site plan, and then, and then as a second question on that, I wouldn't mind... Um, Mr. Pink's comment as well, if this is an area that we should be exploring or not. Thank you. Hey, I, before I hand it over to Mr. Pink, uh, I, I don't know how many people indicated it was a comment. We can certainly uh, reach out to Lura and try to find that out. I think what they were trying to do was to pick out uh, all of the comments that they felt uh, were, were relevant and particularly in cases where there was a difference of opinion so that we were aware of the differences out there without quantifying them. Uh, it wasn't like we were trying to get everybody to vote on everything because that would be a, a very different type of engagement process. We just wanted people's thoughts. Uh, so I think their, 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 their goal was to get as many of those thoughts out there so we knew what they were um, and we could debate them. Uh, Mr. Pink? Mr. Pink. Thank you, uh, Chair Bridger. Uh, you know, I can't provide uh, legal advice, uh, advice per se, but if, if one of the principal reasons for requiring site plan agreements is to attempt to absolve the municipality from any liability from issuing permits in a floodplain, I think some lawyers may argue that uh, by identifying that in agreements and uh, documenting it, that, that may not be advantageous. Uh, I think there's some debate there. I know ca past councils had that discussion uh, when we were discussing a uh, blasting bylaw and whether uh, regulating blasting and requiring permits uh, would then uh, bring us right in the middle of that fray uh, when issues arise. So uh, like I say, I think uh, it's not a firm answer, but I think there's some debate as to whether putting an agreement, absolving yourself of liability really achieves that objective. I'd like to note as well, just to follow up on that, that in the draft policy directions that were prepared before these final ones, we actually had that in there, but we took that out because we had those same concerns. Okay, so I, I am sensing that we can go ahead with the flooding area, the questions answered and comments made. Um, is there anybody who has a concern with the direction this is going at this point? Okay, Mr. McDonald, I think we're on to the next one. All right, so the next one I have is policy direction five, dealing with cumulative impacts. And I think uh, this also came from member Arnie and this is on page, page uh, seven, uh, sorry, not page seven. It would be page, uh, yeah, page, Page hey, seven, sorry about that. And I think her only comment was that if we're getting into cumulative impacts as a policy uh, going forward, there's a need for baseline data collection. And I would wholeheartedly agree that that's of course the case. And I think it's certainly implied. Don't think we need to change the policy direction to say that, but certainly with without having baseline data, that's very, very difficult to assess impacts. So I would certainly agree with you, uh, Member Arnie on that. Uh, I, I'm thinking, I. I'm hoping I got your the sense of what you were saying, uh, but uh, would ask you to comment on that. Member Arnie. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Yes, I think you've captured it, Nick. My, it was partly in process that I was asking the question because that reference is in the discussion notes, but it isn't in the actual column for policy directions. And I felt that uh, future council should be 
have the policy direction to move forward on that uh, data collection. So thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that that works. Uh, just uh, one comment before we move on. Uh, this is for our counselors. We have another meeting at four o'clock after this one. Please don't go off Zoom. We don't have a separate sign in for that. We're asking everybody just to just to stay on. So sorry, Mr. McDonald, carry on. All right, so I'm gonna suggest we may perhaps do one more and then perhaps call it a day uh, and then leave some time for any additional discussion. Perhaps we can talk about uh, the next meeting and, and how that's going to work. Uh, but the, the next one we can talk about is policy direction six, which is uh, dealing with watershed planning. And I think uh, this came from member Arnie as well. And that's also on page seven. And I think the comment was more about making sure that if we're going down the watershed planning route, that we develop as many partnerships as possible with the watershed the Muskoka Watershed Council and other non-government agencies. And I would certainly agree that that makes a lot of sense. Not sure it needs to be in the policy direction per se, uh, but uh, uh, obviously the more partnerships you have when you're dealing with something like watershed planning, the better uh, you are. Um, Member Arnie, did I get that correct? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair. Yes, it's not just the NGOs, it's with other levels of government. There are silos, very severe silos operating in Muskoka, governing Muskoka. And I thought that it would help to have policy direction that councils look to improve and expand those connections and for collaboration going forward into integration greater watershed management. I would also like to point out that is coming out, uh, I think fairly clearly in the strategic plan uh, process. There are many uh, references to it. So I thought maybe to parallel that, we should include it uh, in our policy direction. Apologies to the group for having so many questions. Okay. Thank you. I, in response, I think with this one, uh, we can certainly easily add something in the, in the form of F that says uh, includes policies that support the development of partnerships uh, with uh, other levels of government, the Muskoka Watershed Council and non-governmental agencies and the implementation of these policies. So I think that would be a simple add that I can easily support and, and put in here to respond to that comment. Okay, great. So I think we're I think we're good with that then, Mr. McDonald. So if you'd like to carry on with uh, what you'd like to do next. All right. Uh, what I'd like to do next, I guess uh, we are definitely having a meeting on Friday for sure. And in order to speed things up, what we're going to do is with the policy directions already discussed, uh, we will uh, make the changes. There are not many, uh, but we will make the changes tomorrow and send those back around just to make sure everyone sees what we have done. And again, it will be very minor so that we can put those to bed and not have to rediscuss those again in the future. And as well on Friday, of course, uh, we will go through the remaining policy directions that have been identified to date. And if anyone wants to talk about another one not identified already, uh, please let us know in advance or obviously wait till Friday to bring that up. That's fine too. Uh, we're here at your uh, beck and call, so to speak, to, to talk through any of these uh, as uh, we go through them. And of course, uh, we will have to leave enough time on Friday to discuss any other uh, areas of interest to any of the uh, PAC members um, or uh, or working group members going forward. Um, and I certainly look forward uh, to that. So with that being said, I'm thinking we could probably bring this to a close at this point, unless there are any folks that uh, wish to bring anything else up. Well, funny you mentioned that. I've got two already. So member Thompson. Yeah, and just given that you mentioned that you're going to be coming back with some slightly revised policy directions that we've already discussed, I don't know whether this fits in, but I just want to say that I agree wholeheartedly with Mayor Harding's comment about adding a maximum percent of hardscaping or site disturbance. And maybe that's a zoning issue, but um, to give some kind of direction in the in the in the OP might be might be appropriate. I don't know. I just we, I've heard from so many people that we need policies to deal deal with clear cutting and deal with you know people who want 
you know, the tennis court and the fire pit and the swimming pool and, the, and lots of pads everywhere. And, and, and there's currently nothing that stops them from doing that. So um, I agree that, uh, that that's something that should be looked at. And I don't, whether it's the OP or the zoning, I'll, I leave that up to you. Um, I would note in response that in policy direction 1E, we actually have um, suggested policies that uh, talk about updated site alteration policies and targets for all permeable and non-permeable surfaces on a lot. And we provide a whole bunch of examples, driveways, pathways, stair, stair accesses, sun decks, party decks, outside fireplaces, and sitting areas. So we've got that covered already. And we did note in here as well that if we go down this road, that the township site alteration bylaw would also have to be updated as well to, to deal with that. But I think we've got that covered, uh, Lori. Okay, thank you, thanks. Okay, and uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, on the comment, I think I really like the idea that you're going to update the documentary now in the next meeting. Uh, in doing so, I'm sure you're going to highlight those areas so that we can quickly find them. Definitely, uh, for sure. Okay. All right. Any other comments from anyone? Okay. Well, listen, thank you very much, everyone. Um, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Diamond, for uh, your guidance today. I think we did a lot of good work. And we will look forward to seeing everyone at 9 a.m. on Friday morning back here again. So everybody have a good evening. And don't turn off your cameras, Council. Oh, I have to, sorry, I have, we have to officially end this. My apologies. Okay, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Zavitz. Pardon? Sorry. Okay. Moved by Councillor Edwards, uh, seconded by Councillor Mazam, be it resolved that pursuant to Section 232 of the Township's Procedural Bylaw, Where's? Oh, sorry, I got so organized, I unorganized myself. Okay, <laughs> moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that the special planning and official review, official plan review working committee meeting adjourn at three fifty p.m. All in favor? We, we've carried. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you Friday morning. Well, we'll see everybody, remember, in 10 minutes, but uh, <laughs> yeah. keep the Zoom meeting going, and we will resume right at 4 o'clock. <laughs>